I'd like to greet you at this conference on nonconformism and dissent in the Soviet bloc, guiding legacy or passing memory. Uh, the conference is organized by the Ukrainian Studies Program here at the Harriman, the East Central European Center at Columbia, the Polish Cultural Institute, uh, and the Ukrainian Museum of New York. And we would like to thank all these organizations uh, for bringing together what I view as a fascinating two and a half days before us. Uh, I also would like to greet the General Counsel of Ukraine, Serhii Pod here, uh, and I think it's also a sign of uh, the different world from the world of the dissidents and nonconformists uh, that uh, we can honestly greet the Ukrainian uh, general council here. Uh, in the older days, we were more likely to see representatives of a UN mission of the Ukrainian Republic uh, that was usually there observing other things than uh, joining us in discussion. So the world has changed in that way, I think, very, very positively. Uh, I uh, have the honor uh, of introducing uh, our speaker, Miroslav Maranovich, to you. Uh, Mr. Maranovich was born in 1949 uh, in the Drohobitska area of Ukraine. Uh, and when one looks at his CV, uh, his biography today, we would say it fits very much the normal academic world uh, of this university. That is, one can see that since the 1990s, he's been lecturer on history of Christianity of Ukraine at the Institute of Management in Drohobych, then director of the Institute of Religion and Society at the Lviv Theological Academy, then president of the Institute of Religion and Society at the Ukrainian Catholic University, rising then to be uh, the vice rector of the, at that university, uh, his current position. That we would say a rather normal academic uh, curriculum for someone who works on religious studies, uh, a topic frequent today. And we see the distinguished list of his fellowships, including I think we are honored to say fellowship here at Columbia University, the Center of Human Rights, Religion, uh, uh, Human Rights and Religious Freedom Program, an, inter an internship at Emory University, internships at the World Council of Churches in Switzerland, Fellowship at the Institute of Eastern Christian Studies at the Catholic University of Nimegen, Nimegen in the Netherlands, uh, the Marian Dönhoff Fellowship at the University of Würzburg, and uh, I'm pleased to say, being from Canada, Canada, the Kolaski Fellowship at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies in Edmonton, and his distinguished list of publications, Ukraine at the Margins of Holy Scripture, uh, Ukraine a long way through the desert, something at least in a religious studies a topic we would see, various works on human rights, discussions of Ukrainians and Jews and their uh, para paradigmatic models of survival, uh, discussions on the Ukrainian idea in Christianity, uh, publications in English on an ecumenist uh, analyzes the history and prospects of religion in Ukraine quite the normal publications of someone at a major Catholic university, as the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv is. And yet we know really this is not the normal biography uh, of an academic, uh, because before those years, uh, when we look at Mr. Maranovich's past, uh, we find that uh, uh, as a member of the Ukrainian Helsinki group from 1976, he was arrested in 1977 and sentenced to 12 years, seven years in prison in the Perm Oblast and then in exile in Kazakhstan. Uh, he didn't quite finish all those years because the intervention of, of Glasnost and Perestroika meant that at a certain point he was released and then that very strange phrase rehabilitated, which I always find so hard to say, rehabilitated before whom and why and who gave them the right to rehabilitate. That is uh, his courageous stand for human rights that was nonconformism of that time and inevitably drew people to dissent was part of his career that took him out of a, a, a original education in rather technical uh, field and world and then brought him into the world of, of the gulag of the Soviet Union and then out into a world in which he has 
concentrated on ecumenical, uh, religious, and Christian issues, and to speak out uh, on human rights. It's really quite a, a distinguished and interesting career, uh, fascinating to us now to be able to talk with him. Because I think as this public assembles and, and looking at various generations, for some, we are really discussing a distant history for some of our students now. For many of us here, uh, we are discussing uh, a movement that became central in our own lives. Uh, I think of the Ukrainian student associations of the 60s and 70s who, who campaigned so for dissident movements of people one could never dream you were going to meet. And now we can today then gather together with so many of the distinguished dissidents and nonconformist figures uh, whom we studied and knew earlier. And of those, of course, one of our most distinguished is our keynote speaker, uh, who will begin a program uh, that I think will look into many of these issues in trying to discuss uh, what expectations were, what rosy expectations were, and what the reality at times bitter has come uh, in the minds of those who led that very important phase for the three countries we will be looking at uh, for uh, Russia, Ukraine, and Poland. Mr. Mandanovich. Thank you very much, Professor Sisson. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, this conference is devoted to the history of dissent in the former Soviet Union. And I, as a former uh, Ukrainian dissident, would like to use this opportunity to offer a special introductory reflection. It is my moral duty and great personal privilege to thank all those who made our mission possible those who risked their diplomatic or professional positions by meeting with us in that empire of evil, those who transferred our materials to the free world, the ones who helped our voices be heard, all those who gave us their invaluable support. Here, I mean governments and ordinary citizens, diplomats and journalists, editors and media communicators, cultural figures and religious communities. I mean people of varied ethnic origins, in my case Ukrainian living in diaspora, but also those whose connection with Ukrainian or Russian, Baltic or Caucasian, Caucasian cultures had been established simply through human solidarity and compassion. Let their efforts be blessed. Let their support be never forgotten. On behalf of all former dissidents, I would like to express our deep gratitude to our well-known and maybe still unknown beneficiaries and ask you to be the recipients and mediators of this gratitude. The genesis of the Ukrainian dissident movement was twofold, predetermined by the twofold nature of the Soviet regime. As a totalitarian state and as a Russian empire camouflaged under the Communist Union. <coughs> On the one hand, the dissident movement was an attempt to provide serious resistance to the totalitarian state and aimed at the democratization of the society. In this sense, Ukrainian dissidents shared the position of all Soviet dissidents and have the Russian human rights circles in Moscow as an example to follow. And let me say at the very beginning, the support by our colleagues in Moscow was just invaluable. At its early stages, the cross-Soviet dissident movement had been fed by the hopes generated by the debunking of the so-called 
cult of Stalin after the 20s, Congress of the Communist Party in 1856. And by a certain democratization, often addressed as Khrushchev so thought. A crisis of official com communist identity occurred. Uh, the former Stalinist ideological standards had, had been reconsidered, and the official history of the state had been rewritten. Belief in the justice of the Soviet system had been injured, but not fat fatally. The most active core of the dissident movement at that time consisted of optimistic and, to some extent, idealistic communists who wished distortions of the Lenin official policy to be removed and the existing system to be transformed into communism with a human fa face. On the other hand, the Ukrainian dissident movement derived its inspiration from the liberation struggle of Ukrainians, especially strengthened in the first half of the 20th century. In some sense, it was a continuation of this struggle, but using different means. The movement for cultural, rel religious, and later civil rights had objectively weakened the Moscow colonial regime and therefore promoted independent trends within various nations subjugated. Uh, this liberation aspect made Ukrainian, l like li uh, Lithuanian, uh, Georgian and other dissidents different from Russian dissidents who often considered national movements, including the Ukrainian one, to be not truly democratic or polluted with national nationalistic demands. Therefore, the Ukrainian dissident movement also included those politically oriented figures for whom the struggle for human rights was a promising instrument for achieving the main goal, the political independence of Ukraine, rather than a religion of a soul, of their soul. They prefer even to use the term resistance movement instead of dissident movement. They deliberately avoid defining themselves as dissidents, preferring to be addressed as political prisoners or fighters for, for the independence of Ukraine. The Ukrainian dissident movement underwent several phases of development. The first one was the period of romantic hopes, and this st started in the public sphere with the foundation of free cultural clubs at the beginning of the 60s in Kyiv and Lviv. During their discussion, intellectuals cautiously tried to express opinions on literature and culture which were different from the official ones. This period lasted until the first arrests of 1965 used by the government to put an end to dangerous free thinking. The second period could be called a period of confusion and depression. After a certain phase of public protests by the courageous against arrests, embarrassment and confusion arose. There was a hope, though constantly weakening, that those arrests were simply a mistake. This period lasted until the second wave of arrests in 1972-73. The third period was therefore the period of reorientation. Of course, many people were disappointed and felt despair because illusions about the humanitarian evolution of the regime were completely shattered, while the light at the end of the tunnel had not yet appeared. However, the disposition of dissidents had been radicalized, and it became clearly visible in the materials of Samvedau, the Ukrainian replica of the Russian Samizdat, 
That is opposition literature illegally printed at home on a typewriter. Cautious cultural free thinking had been gradually replaced by the substantial criticism of the regime and the ever more resolute conclusion concerning the inevitability of its changing. At that period, the broader name Ukrainian dissidents defined a diverse group of the not agreeing, consisting of a reasonable intelligentsia, which dreamt first of all about freedom of expression, human rights activists who responded to the international human rights call, and political fighters who expressed their longing for the change of the regime and for the independence of Ukraine. The fourth period of the dissident movement in Ukraine may be called that of human rights. It was inspired by 1975 Helsinki Accords between the Organization of Sec for Security and Cooperation in Europe members, including the USSR. The first group for promoting the fulfillment of Helsinki Accords uh, was founded on May the 12th, uh, 1976 in Moscow. The Ukrainian Helsinki group was next. It was founded on November 9th, 1976, by a group of 10 dissidents, myself included, headed by the writer Mykola Rudenko. The group publicized its declaration in Western media, claiming its purely human rights, non-underground nature, and following the example of the Moscow group, providing names and addresses of its members. Very soon it became clear, however, that non-underground groups were even more dangerous for the Soviet regime than those underground. After three months of hesitation, the KGB decided to punish the Ukrainian Helsinki group members for, I quote, spreading anti-Soviet propaganda aimed at undermining the Soviet state and social order, end quote. The crime considered, according to the USSR criminal code, to be the most dangerous state crime. During the next few years, authorities arrested eight Ukrainian Helsinki group members, myself included, and expelled from the country the other two. The persecutions had not frightened the non-agreeing. Instead, they had mobilized a protesting portion of Ukrainian society. As a result, during the 1980s, the group experienced two more waves of kamikaze membership, which were inevitably persecuted. Today, it is being suggested that there were 41 Ukrainian Helsinki group members in total. The group had never announced its dissolution and continued its activity either in prison or abroad. For the whole period of Ukrainian Helsinki group existence, only one renunciation, Oles Berdnik, and one suicide, Mikhailo Melnik took place. On July 7th, 1988, that is during the time of Gorbachev's perestroika, some members of the Ukrainian Helsinki group declared the foundation of the Ukrainian Helsinki Union uh, with clear politi political goals. The latter, in fact, was a prototype of a political party. At the time of the Ukrainian independence, members of the 1960-1980 Ukrainian resistance movement had become differentiated according to different social political orientations. Those who were working for change the, the, to change the system had headed the political opposition and made political careers. They became members of parliament and leaders of political parties.
The smaller portion of dissidents, again myself included, refused to take part in political activities and continued to defend human rights or act in the cultural or religious field. Finally, one more part of former dissidents, because of their age or health problems, withdrew from any activity, limiting themselves only to participation in some opportune public events. <clears throat> the diversity of different political orientations chosen by former dissidents met brisk criticism later on. Instead of one consolidated opposition party, it was a conglomeration of rival groups united mostly around former dissident leaders who stood in opposition to communists. It was considered by, to be weakness or even some responsibility for the dissident movement because its diversity resulted in conflictual divisions. In fact, the dissident movement had never been monolithic and therefore could not satisfy all people's expectations. Indeed, dissidents were united, first of all, in the non-acceptance of the imperial and totalitarian communist system, though each of them saw the future development of Ukraine differently. The importance of the dissident movement, at least in Ukraine, lies in the fact that just as a chemical particle can crystallize an oversaturated solution, the appearance of dissidents allowed the crystallization of people's expectations and their disobedience. As Andrei Amalric accurately said, they <clears throat> dissident, I quote, quote, made a brilliantly simple thing. In a country that was not free, they began to act as free people, and because of that started to change the moral atmosphere and the traditions that ruled the country, end quote. Their merits in this are invaluable and beyond doubt. At the same time, unlike in the Czech Republic, for example, Ukrainian dissidents had not led their society to a final victory of democracy. Victories they achieved were partially temporary, and the enormous passionate energy was misused, misused by other political forces. However, in spite of evident human weaknesses and failures of the Ukrainian dissidents, one cannot pronounce a sentence upon them. This is because the third wave of democratization, according to Huntington, ran up against the invisible but very real cultural wall which existed between the two cultural civilizations, I mean Euro-Atlantic and Euro-Asian ones. The Ukrainian dissidents were not able to overcome this wall in principle. Difficulties of sub subsequent decays lead me to the conclusion that the task of all Ukrainians who want a better country must lie in the creation of an intermediary body that will not allow destructive conflict to pull apart both civilizations, rather than in a mechanical transfer of Euro-Atlantic models of democracy into a qualitatively different Euro-Asian civilization. This would permit the fulfillment of a twofold task. First, in this way, the unity of the Ukrainian nation which is predestined to exist on both sides of the barricade, barricade uh, may be safeguarded. Secondly, by fulfilling this national task, Ukraine at the same time may fulfill the civilization task of harmonization of two cultural worlds. Now let's turn to the topic of values of dissidents and the present time. Today, Ukrainian dissidents may, at the same time, be proud of the participation in obvious national democratic achievements, 
but also be in despair about not less evident moral failures. One of the most important values supported by fighters of the movement of resistance was freedom, civil, national, religious freedom, and the freedom of self-expression. These goals were mainly achieved through, though everything can be understood relatively. Until the year uh, 2010, and the level of civic freedoms was much higher than that in Soviet times. In the country there was real freedom of the press, though it was based not on the existence of the middle class, which is relatively weak in Ukraine, but rather on the reality of political clans. The big achievement of Ukrainian democracy, especially after the Orange Revolution, was the freedom of elections, though electoral legislation had some holes that made some falsification and manipulation of voices possible. Finally, the fate of Ukrainian democracy seems to be that of all weak democracies. As a result of the year uh, 2010, free elections, those who came to power are actively changing the legislation to avoid losing power in the future. Therefore, weak democracy has logically been transformed into an imitative democracy. Violations of human rights did not disappear. They only changed their character. Ukrainian authorities still traumatize human dignity in a different way. And that leads to the diminishment of the scope of people's rights and the level of citizens' responsibility. Corruption is destroying the state system of justice and the courts. Thus, the former dissidents cannot rest on their laurels. Ukrainian independence was was achieved, but due to different factors, the actual independence is considerably weakened. The inner interregional differences that could become a richness for a state in harmony <coughs> takes forms of contradictions that are hard to overcome. These differences are being abused by some political forces who inside one uh, part of the nation against the other. This also influences the geopolitical position of Ukraine because it happens to be divided into two parts. One part of Ukrainian society has chosen a Euro-Atlantic geopolitical orientation wanting to legitimately join the EU and find a shelter in a collective security system, first of all NATO, from the neo-imperialistic aspirations of Russia. Incidentally, this is, this is exactly the position most dissidents identify themselves with. The other part of Ukrainian society considers itself belonging to the Russian, Eurasian cultural area this makes Ukraine more vulnerable with its energy dependence on Russia. In this case, the concept of the geopolitical security of Russia does not presuppose uh, the true independence of Ukraine. Inter-ethnic <clears throat> inter peace is being man maintained in Ukraine and the freedom of ethnic minorities is mainly safeguarded. In this sense, the goal of the dissidents has been fulfilled. However, the inertia of the previous Soviet model, Russian and Russian-speaking majority versus non-Russian minorities, is still considerably present. According to this model, Ukrainians were a discriminated minority. After 20 years of independence, Ukrainians have not succeeded in the realization of their status of ethnic majority, <clears throat> and in safeguarding their cultural rights in certain 
regions in Ukraine, that is, in the east and south of the country and in Crimea. Moreover, after the, the year 2010 elections, the counter-offensive of Russia-speaking Russian -speaking politicians began to take place. In order to safeguard the comfort of one language, Russian regime, they demagogically insist that there are two official languages in Ukraine, Ukraine and Russian. In addition, these political forces attempt to misuse international mechanisms <coughs> developed for defending weaker or vanish vanishing languages to safeguard the monopoly of the Russian language, which is strong even without this ploy. This not only brings to nothing the expectations of dissidents that in the independent state Ukrainian culture and language will develop freely. The counter-offensive of these Russian-speaking extremes move Ukraine away from balanced harmony between the titular nation and ethnic minorities, which was also the dream of dissidents. I mean harmony, of course. <clears throat> One of the most obvious achievements of Ukrainian democracy was, and hopefully still is, the progress in the sphere of religious freedom. Thanks to some parity between different religious and confessional groups, this freedom demonstrated an ability for self-stabilization and self-adjustment. Certain dissidents played an important personal role in the revival of previously persecuted religious organizations <clears throat> and in uh, initiating interreligious and interconfessional cooperation. During the year uh, 2010, there was also an, an attempt of pro-Russian forces to turn this situation back to the past by giving some preferences to the Moscow Patriarch. The idea of the Russian world developed by Patriarch Kirill I of Moscow is being used by the Moscow Patriarchate against its and its supporters in state authorities to make the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate almost the established church of Ukraine and press back all of its rivals. Religious rights of some Orthodox rivals of the Moscow Patriarchate are obviously violated. However, I do hope that to put the religion's genie back into the bottle of the Third Rome will be most difficult. Thus, in many determinative par parameters of national existence, the dissident mission was successful enough, but it has not become irreversible and has not received the necessary legislative and system guarantees. Therefore, the question of its future importance for the nation is still open. There are two spheres, however, in which this mission underwent deadly failure. The dissidents' belief in establishing the rule of law and in the post-communist revival of social and personal ethics. The injustice and immorality of the communist period has been copied under different ideological slogans, but at the same time has even been strengthened in certain areas. The old mechanisms of regulating injustice and immorality have lost their efficiency, but new ones have not been developed. The court system has become the instrument of the ruling authorities for settling accounts with the opposition. Mass corruption undermines the self-confidence of the nation in the possibility of influencing the course of events and make social recovery possible. 
The Orange Revolution managed to revive the hope of part of the nation in their own abilities, but not for long. The Solzhenitsyn old slogan, not to live a lie, remains a dream. In spite of all achievements in the sphere of freedom of speech, modern Ukraine does not live the, the truth. As we mentioned before, freedom of speech and press is based on a variety of clans, each of whom, according to its own interests, speaks only a part of the truth, adding some part of propagandistic lie. Therefore, a whole set of semi-truths are interacting in the country. And this causes confusion among the people and is accepted by them as one big untruth. Few people in Ukraine nowadays believe in the possibility of building a just order. The weakness of civil society allows uncontrollable economic and ministry misuse. The crisis of the court system causes a feeling of being defenseless. Thus, the dissidents' hopes of establishing the rule of law have not been fulfilled. This raises a question about the correctness of the dissidents' position taken after the collapse of the Soviet Union in the matter of bringing communists to justice for the crimes of the communist regime. In retrospect, we now realize that it was not possible, contrary to dissidents' beliefs, to start with a blank page. <clears throat> Non-repentance for the sins of the communists and non-punishment for their crimes quite naturally resulted in abuses of later administrations. As a result, legal nihilism has developed in the nation and the national discourse easily adapts to clan loyal loyalty and servility. Untruths and cunning behavior are tolerated. One more belief of all the Soviet opposition also failed, that is, the belief that post-communist governments would be wiser and more intellectual. In Ukraine <clears throat> nowadays, Intellectuals try to formulate new and prospective strategies of development, but the latter cannot be fulfilled because of the closed nature of the ruling powers. The authorities use intellect only for their political egos. <coughs> Thank you very much. <coughs> Voices. Voices of rare moral authorities, for example, the voice of Johann Svrstjup, are also less effective. Because of the self-isolation of the ruling elite in the fortress of power, these voices are crying in the desert in vain. The weakness of their voices is caused not because the nation allegedly does not share their conclusions about the moral degradation of the ruling, ruling elite. According to some studies, more than 55% of those surveyed mentioned moral degradation as the main reason for the present social problems of Ukraine. <clears throat> the real problem lies in the fact that people are not eager to be in opposition to legal and moral high-handedness because it seems to them that without people's solidarity it would be too dangerous, unprofitable and consequently unattractive. Under these circumstances, Ukraine needs a new solidarity civic movement, a movement for the implementation of the rule of law and for the moral recovery of the society. The ability of former dissidents to initiate such a movement is limited. Some of them are too old, others, because of political compromises of previous years, have ceased to be moral authorities for the nation 
So the question remains open as to who will lead this, in my opinion, inevitable civic movement in the future. Instead, we may rather firmly state that former dissidents laid down the main precondition for that, the life of freedom. During the last two decades, the Ukrainian nation moved through a valuable school of freedom. And even if the experience achieved is partially negative, it is still invaluable for the ability of the individual to mature from the totalitarian vice to the level of a responsible citizen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Actually, in the history of uh, the dis dissident movement, uh, we know that uh, there were uh, some uh, uh, groups oriented uh, on workers and are actually represented by workers. But in general, uh, the human rights uh, groups are not so closed to the working class. Uh, there is some uh, intellectual barrier <laughs> uh, between the, t the two uh, groups. Uh, so, unfortunately, I, uh, looking <laughs> into the past, uh, looking into the history of Polish uh, dissident movement, it, it's really a lost opportunity. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, I'm wondering how Ukrainian students are taught today about <clears throat> late Soviet history and dissidents, whether that's part of the institutionalized school curriculum, and or whether there are any less formal ways in which that dissident history and legacy is shared with the younger generation. It seems to me that uh, there is uh, uh, a big difference between the different part of Ukraine in, in uh, teaching and studying uh, this uh, question. Uh, it's not a problem uh, for Western Ukraine to know its uh, history of dissident movement. And uh, um, for example, I uh, have a facultative course at the Ukrainian Catholic University, which is exactly named as the history of uh, liberational movement in uh, the uh, 60s and uh, 80s, uh, but uh, it's rather difficult to organize such courses in uh, some uh, high um, in some universities in eastern Ukraine or especially Crimea, uh, or even practically impossible to give such an information at secondary schools. It seems to me that this history is still unknown. And uh, the tendency is uh, not to the um, spreading this information about our students, but vice versa about hiding. Uh, I remember the discussion uh, uh, with the head of uh, archive department in in Ukraine about the about using these archives for uh, explaining the history of communism in Ukraine, and the the head of this department is communist itself, is a communist woman. So she said. Uh, Actually, it's, it's, it was difficult history. Let's, it's better for us not to touch it. <laughs> so, <laughs> unfortunately. Yes. Would you 
tell us how well the Indian government after the 1990s, after 91, accepted the uh, dissidents, paid tribute to what they had done, um, and, and incorporated them into, into the society that was building. Uh, there were different phases, uh, phases uh, in this sense. I remember the attempt of uh, President Leonid Kravchuk uh, to honor Ukrainian dissidents and uh, political prisoners who were rehabilitated uh, by paying some, uh, some money uh, for them. But it was uh, the whole idea transformed into something very offensive uh, because uh, it was at the time when uh, um, money uh, were rapidly losing its uh, value and I remember that I just refused to, to go to receive this money because it was just nothing. <laughs> it was really offensive for, for, for people to receive. Uh, at, the, at some stage, uh, the society in the whole decided that, well, maybe it's too much of dissidents. Uh, because at the beginning, they, they, were, um, they were honored by being members of, of, of Ukrainian parliament and so on. And uh, this reaction was very understandable for me. Uh, because uh, I'm sure that the interest to this dissident movement will be uh, up and down. It's, it cannot be the same uh, during different periods of uh, Ukrainian development. <clears throat> and now uh, there is sort of uh, silent, untouching, uh, untouching, untouching. Yes. Mm. Di as far as I know, dissidents are not persecuted, even for what they say. Uh, but at the same time, they are not honored. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, Anna Protzik, City University of New York. From what we have heard in an excellent presentation and from the questions that have been asked, uh, it is quite clear that Ukrainian dissidents, and not only Ukrainian dissidents, but Georgian dissidents and Russian dissidents, have been marginalized during the past 20 years. This question has been addressed by a number of speakers at our conferences here at Columbia. Definitely it was addressed by uh, Pavel Litvinov. Um, also, this question was raised in my paper at our last conference. And we asked that we pay more attention to that, and that is to explore the reasons for the marginalization of the former pre um, dissidents in the Soviet Union. Would you care to um, tell us what is your opinion? What are the reasons for this development, sad development, we would say? It's, it's very difficult for me to say resolutely, uh, to, to say Mm, without any hesitation that there is really uh, uh, marginalization and that there is no marginalization. The truth, uh, truth is somewhere between the two uh, options. I want to be sincere that uh, some dissidents mm, are not at the top of understanding uh, of what is going on in Ukraine. So the society may respect them, but it doesn't mean that society, the society has always put them in the center of their uh, attention. Uh, at least it seems, as a former dissident, I, I don't want to be in the center of uh, uh, social attention 
exclusively for the fact that I was arrested and uh, uh, being uh, and was uh, in, in, in detention. It is uh, not only responsibility for uh, this is for, uh, the responsibility of society to honor uh, those people, but also the responsibility of those people. Uh, uh, well. <laughs> Attract attention, to be uh, to be uh, politically realistic, uh, to be politically important. So it's it's the the responsibility of both sides, according to my understanding. My name is Henry Wyatt, uh, uh, and uh, I was three times, uh, I don't know, was many times in Ukraine, but three times during the Orange Revolution, uh, I monitored the uh, election in Ukraine. I was in Donbass and other regions. And I think that uh, the most uh, important problem in Ukraine is the problem of oligarchy, oligarchy, oligarchy system that in Donbass, in Dniepro, Dniepropietrovsk, in Kiev, there are uh, some groups of oligarchy which govern Ukraine. And to this time, uh, where this uh, oligarchy system will dominate Ukraine, it, will, it, it is impossible to uh, develop a democracy. To this time, is the main important problem of Ukraine that uh, they try to uh, develop uh, democracy, but is uh, pressed by this oligarchy system. Do you think? Uh, uh, what do you think about this? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, the list of uh, main problems of Ukraine is seems to be uh, non-exhaustive. Uh, but uh, you're right, this is one of very important uh, problem. Uh, it is becoming more important now under the new uh, presidential administration because according to my understanding, uh, the activity of the middle class is being suppressed in favor of olig oligarchs. I may be wrong, but it is my opinion. I'm, I cannot, I'm not a, an expert in economy, but at least what I see is that uh, people who <coughs> managed uh, to find some uh, way of existence uh, due to their own money, their own efforts, are now in big trouble uh, because of different uh, means of suppress. So uh, I would imagine the way when uh, big money of our oligarchs uh, will work for the society as, for example, Rockefeller money <laughs> work for Amer the American society. But uh, I, I don't, don't see uh, the positive trends in this sense. Vice versa, I see the negative uh, reaction. <clears throat> Kathy Mipomnishi, Barnard College. Um, I'd like to pick up from a slightly different point of view on Professor Kamaromi's question and ask you um, whether you see any younger generation human rights activists who um, are working perhaps on similar value systems but in different, um, using different strategies, perhaps using electronic resources. Um, and uh, who you consider to be um, inheritors of the dissidents' legacy? It seems to me that the whole uh, situation in Ukraine changed, and uh, uh, we cannot have such such a dissident group uh, uh, now as we had in in a previous uh, time. Because for me, dissidents are possible in a totalitarian state, and we, we definitely have no totalitarian system in Ukraine now. <clears throat> we have uh, some human rights group 
groups, for example, as uh, in Kharkiv. A Kharkiv uh, human rights uh, group, which is very powerful, very professional. Uh, I, I just admire uh, their activity. There are some other uh, groups. Um, but what, what is uh, uh, very important and optimistic for me in present Ukraine is the knowledge how democracy works, uh, the knowledge of young people among young people. Uh, let, let me tell you one story. Uh, during the presidential administration of Leonid Kuchma, uh, I was very angry on young people who uh, were part of human rights seminars organized by Western countries, including the United States, and no visible results of that. The country is, is still authoritarian, and uh, young people are, are, are silent. Uh, I remember one seminar when I just exploded, <laughs> and I said very strong words to uh, young people. But later, during the Orange Revolution, it was very clear that actually we have a different generation already. We have generation educated in the pro present uh, system models of democracy. Uh, I remember many uh, young people from Eastern Ukraine came to the Ukrainian Catholic University for Christmas Together action organized by us. And we uh, had a discussion of the positive and negative sides of uh, Orange of the Orange Revolution. I remember I was ready uh, to organize the discussion, to explain some things. I prepared some <laughs> analysis. Nothing was needed. Excellent uh, understanding of, of democracy, no matter from what region young people came, uh, Donetsk or uh, Lviv or Lutsk or other, other places of Ukraine. So I was really impressed by that. This is our hope. <laughs> Andrew Grigorenko of uh, Petro Grigorenko Foundation. Uh, I would like to continue about the uh, perspective of the new generation. You know that uh, I'm now just visiting Ukraine. First time I was allowed to visit in '92, and uh, visited several times. And uh, my impression was a kind of contradictory, uh, looking at the younger generation. Uh, I just uh, give probably a couple of examples. When uh, I arrived in '92 in Kiev, everybody spoke Ukrainian with a Russian accent, but doesn't matter that everybody tried to speak Ukrainian. Then I returned about three years later, Kyiv spoke Russian again. Uh, and uh, it was not much of the pro-Ukrainian feeling in Kyiv. But then I returned again another few years, I don't recall exactly. Uh, Kyiv still was uh, mostly Russian speaking, but now the Russian-speaking people were associated themselves to Ukraine and considered themselves to Ukrainian. And uh, that I should probably also mention that, as you know, that ethnically that Ukraine actually that uh, monolithic in a way, but part of the Ukrainian ethnic Ukrainians are Russian speakers. And that's a complicated situation uh, by itself. And you said uh, that countries uh, are western and eastern part of a different and southern part. Uh, you know that, again, I don't know that for me, more difficult to judge. Yet, yeah, I know that it's in Kharkiv, everybody speaks Russian practically. But if before, in the Soviet Union, I was just in, uh, before I was uh, forced to leave, 
I uh, came to Kyiv uh, this visit and I asked, uh, because I had not much time, I asked in the line waiting for the taxi in Ukrainian, who is the last in the, and the last person stopped cursing me in Russian and saying that uh, speak uh, human language. And uh, that definitely changed. Now, when I was visiting the last time, I just uh, tried to be a provocateur. I just uh, tried to speak in Ukrainian in Kharkiv and Kyiv, and everybody tried to answer me in Ukrainian, or some people apologize that they cannot speak Ukrainian and answer in Russian. And uh, vice versa, because people were saying that in Lviv it's impossible to speak Russian. Uh, you probably remember when I just <laughs> asked somebody who definitely spoke Ukrainian in Russian something, and they did answer in Russian, by the way. So that um, what I'm trying, um, driving to, that uh, on the other hand, is some conversations with younger generation. I noticed that uh, what was difficult for me, in myself, my, my own evolution, to arrive at understanding that uh, law should prevail, that Rome might fall, but the law should prevail. And uh, on the other hand, there is another uh, part of my prolonged question, that also we know that house divided cannot stand, and that's still present, even whatever what feeling, and even uh, uh, blue and yellow flags everywhere, but it still uh, seems to me that it's my impression, it's a little bit as from outside, that uh, those understanding of a divided house and uh, prevail, prevailing of law, how it is with this younger generation. And I understand that dissidents just uh, getting older and uh, we're all getting older but then just dying out uh, slowly. <laughs> but, uh, and uh, of course, uh, country is different and uh, I would like to know what is uh, your view from inside, uh, what the perspective for the younger generation to bring country to a civilized world, uh, in a way. Uh, sorry for that uh, phrasing. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> it seems to me that the main problem of Ukraine is not in the fact that uh, some Ukrainians speak Russian, some Ukrainian, and, and, and vice versa. Uh, the main problem of Ukraine is that this difference is being misused by the politicians. Uh, and two, one part is being uh, directed against the other part. Uh, it's very clear now, for example, when uh, uh, the new uh, Minister of Education, Dmitro Tabachnik, is being uh, curtailing, uh, uh, diminishing the sphere of usage of Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian uh, language, uh, just in uh, under under the pretext of uh, um, uh, existence of the Russian-speaking uh, population, and uh, that uh, their rights has to be. Uh, safeguarded. I am absolutely uh, aware that uh, rights of Russian-speaking population of Ukraine, Russian-speaking Ukrainians and Russians have to be safeguarded and I am, as a former uh, dissident, uh, I am in favor of that. Uh, but I am, I don't want, I don't like the injustice is being pre presented to the society in the form of justice. Let me explain. Uh, you know the uh, stadium, uh, the running... Uh, running tracks. Uh, different running tracks. So if you have uh, 
the Finnish line, uh, the, the, uh, the only one for each runners, then you have to put start, starting points on different uh, places because they run difficult, uh, different uh, distance. So, what Tabachnik wants now in Ukraine to put, to draw the line for start and finish at the same for, for all uh, uh, runners. Ukrainian language runs m more distant uh, uh, track and it has to have some uh, fora. Some, uh, some margins of uh, appreciation uh, uh, saying in human rights wording. Uh, in that case, it would be just. Without that, just we have Russian and Ukrainian uh, population. We have to have Russian and Ukrainian la language, uh, languages equally uh, uh, state languages. No, this is wrong. This is against the human rights balance explained the uniqueness of the new draft of the law presented by Dmitro Tabachnik, our new Minister of Education, a uh, draft of the law about uh, language situation. He said that uh, it is normal for European countries that the majority, ethnic majority, tries uh, uh, try to impose its language on other minorities. But it is uniqueness for Europe when the, the country uh, uh, tries to, to diminish the level of usage, uh, the state language, the, the uh, official language of the country, in favor of uh, other languages. So uh, even EU uh, commission, EU diplomats are against that uh, draft of the law because it violates the, 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 the harmony in the society. <clears throat> Young people speak both languages. Uh, so I don't see, uh, I don't see some, um, if politicians do not intervene then young people will find a solution for a linguistic problem in Ukraine. Let me, let me say in short. Uh, thank you, uh, Viktor Balashov, uh, former dissident, and uh, our hub of intellectual descent started in Kiev in military uh, you know, school like West Point, and uh, uh, a former graduate of it was Gritsenko, who was uh, in previous government, uh, Minister of uh, Defense. Uh, what I'm intriguing, I'm following the question of uh, Henrik about oligarch role, but I'm more intrigued with comparison of current uh, situation in Ukraine and in Russia, where Prichnina or neo Bolshevism or neo Czechism or Putinism is taking, you know, fold, and we knew the role of KGB as all dissidents. It wasn't really Communist Party per se who was our counterpart. It was KGB per se, uh, and in Kiev it was a vicious source, as it was in Leningrad in the old time. And my comparison is that in Russia we see how oligarch become near oligarch by Czechism, and I'm intrigued to know what role as institution KGB in new shape is you know playing a role in uh, you know in Ukraine and current Ukraine and do you feel do you do do you sense regardless there is, there is no political prisoners so no political prisoners in Russia but we do know that it's a really you say it's not a totalitarian state in Russia it's also Potemkin village of democracy and non totalitarian state but it's to me, it's deja vu, and the failure of Russian dissidents, or all dissidents in that respect, was, not, was ignoring the problem of really our counterpart. As Anthropov was the K, KGB leader, we really ignored that we are the enemies of, of, of us and who persecuted us, not the Communist Party per se. And I'm talking it on the basis of, uh, how to say, that I'm uh, definitely was 
uh, from Kiev and then in general staff in Moscow with our group of Union, uh, Union of Intellectual Freedom, we were talking about intellectual freedoms. Uh, less concern about KGB, but be, being military cadet and working on par with uh, military intelligence, we knew how a rivalry of the institution and one of the institutions in Russia become a dominant force. So what's, what are you thinking? Is there is any potential danger or cryptic danger of the institution like KGB or over there? Uh, so, uh, it seems to me that there is a clear difference between the situation in Russia and uh, uh, Ukraine in this sense. In Russia, uh, uh, KGB or FSB is uh, a clearly ruling party, clear ru ruling force. It is not the case in Ukraine yet. <laughs> uh, <coughs> But I think that uh, too, ma too many differences in our social or political order, uh, I don't think that we will have the, the same situation. Uh, during the presidency of uh, uh, Yushchenko, uh, I was really impressed that the uh, SBU, as replica of uh, KGB, uh, opened uh, the um, uh, archives uh, of the difficult periods of U Ukraine, including Holodomor. Uh, and I'm, I'm pleased to, to, to say that uh, Pan Volodymyr Vetrovich is present here. Uh, he is one of the figures which was, uh, we, we, we are thankful for them for opening these archives. Uh, it was very important. Then when the new presidential administration came to power, and there was a, a, a clear message sent uh, by the fact that uh, one historian, Ruslan Zabili, uh, was uh, not allowed to think simply, uh, was not allowed uh, to use uh, some uh, m historical materials, archive materials, which are suddenly again uh, uh, closed. I told you about new, uh, about the communist uh, uh, of administrator of uh, archives in, in Ukraine, archive uh, department of Ukraine. And uh, uh, in general, it seems to me that uh, the new head of uh, uh, SBU, um, security uh, forces in Ukraine, uh, is trying, first of all, to monitor the protest uh, potential of Ukrainian society. Uh, he is one of the uh, two untouchable in Ukraine, two untouchable uh, uh, officials in Ukraine. According to uh, uh, social opinion, we have two persons uh, that cannot be removed without permission of Moscow. It is Horoshkovsky uh, as a uh, head of SBU and uh, uh, Dmitry Tabachnik as a uh, minister of education. Uh, so they, they have a special m uh, mission uh, approved by uh, uh, Moscow partners of the uh, uh, present uh, ad presidential administration. Uh, but anyway, I, I, I um, repeat that I don't think that uh, we will have the same, the similar situation in Ukraine with the role of uh, security forces as it is in Russia. Thank you. Zarisky uh, from New York University and also the Center for U.S.-Ukraine Relations. Uh, Mr. Madonovich, uh, because Mr. Vujic brought up a, a, an important issue, something that was actually asked by somebody initially. I'd like to follow up on that and then also 
very shortly on uh, about the youth in the future. So something in the past and then something in the future. It may help in terms of the conference tomorrow and the next day. And that is, you, when it came to Ukrainian dissidents, um, there seemed to have been, uh, as a result, this may have just been history of working itself out in a terribly totalitarian system, but the dissidents have had a hard time being able to, as a result of their sort of isolation, had a hard time being able to finally bring the story to the masses, or to the narit, uh, pravid to the narit. That relationship was an uneasy one. Um, you did explain that some of, some of those dissidents did eventually become political leaders. Ruch certainly came out of that. But I'm wondering, even when, with things like solidarity, trade unions, uh, a religi uh, renewal of religious movements, and so on and so forth, um, the dissidents had an enormous moral authority. Um, and at some point, in not taking on that moral authority in the 90 to 95 period, they did allow, in a way, uh, the komsomol element, the younger komsomol element, to come into play. Some of it became oligarchs, but some of it even in terms of the mod more modern orange democratic movement, we saw some of that old komsomol, uh, the, the taste of that re remained even amongst democratic leaders, who I happened to have seen last, uh, in the last 10 years, I've, I've, I've run into many of them. And uh, I've seen that the old Komsomol attitudes were not able to uh, get washed that easily. I was wondering what happened in that 90 to 95 period um, that the dissidents did not take on more of the responsibility of what we used to call in the Nari, um, the, the responsibility of being a Pravid. Now, second, you gave a very good point that the youngsters now seem to have done this past or post orange. They have now learned democracy on their own and they're so well educated that they may be doing what the Arab street is doing. In fact, it's doing so chaotically that there seems to be no leadership. Is it possible, now this is a second question, is it possible that the Ukrainian dissidents, because they are still in <laughs> available, can they, in the moral morass that the oligarchs and the old Komsomolchi have created in Ukraine, can the dissidents still play a role in the future? Or is this something that basically is left, uh, is left for history and only history can, can devise something? Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> and first of all, it seems to me uh, that uh, dissidents really had some moral authority at the beginning of the 90s, but they, um, they didn't have enough political power to realize uh, their goals. Uh, I mean political goals. Even uh, uh, Chernobyl, uh, the, one of the most prominent uh, political leaders of uh, Ukraine of that time, uh, uh, clearly had, had real difficulty in, uh, uh, in presenting, um, in, in, in winning hearts in, in uh, Ukrainian society. Too many people were afraid of uh, uh, this democratic nationalist movement. And you have to understand that for too long uh, in Eastern Ukraine, in uh, uh, Southern Ukraine, uh, the very mm, uh, the very fact that you speak Ukrainian was to label yourself as a nationalist. I remember that feeling in Kyiv when I, I failed to find a, a work, a job for, for myself. I saw the announcement that they need 
someone to be hired. I came and I proposed myself, but said that in Ukrainian, and immediately I said, no, 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 no. Uh, I, I was told, no, 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 thank you, we don't need any more. So the nation was raised, new generations were raised in the understanding that it is too dangerous to even to speak about some Ukrainian history, Ukrainian future, independence, and, and so on. Uh, so that's why so many people were, they were impressed by the new democratic movement at the beginning of the 90s. They uh, followed for the events with very big interest, but they were afraid. So that's why the model of Leonid Kravchuk uh, independence, but with communists in power, was very uh, attractive for uh, those people. Uh, and the second part about... Uh, Can the dissidents still play a role the uh, amongst the young? Uh, oh, in the future uh, of... Um, um, uh -huh. Yes, that, but that was <laughs> the moment when I said, oh, Lord. <laughs> uh, no, uh, on the one hand, I feel some respect among young people uh, as a former dissident. Uh, but it seems to me that dissidents in general lost the key to uh, hearts of young people. There is something uh, uh, in their minds which is coded in, in a different way than we <laughs> coded. And I, I personally and we uh, cannot decode this uh, secret of uh, young people. Uh, it, it seems to me that uh, probably we will remain respectful, but uh, I would really uh, be surprised if uh, it would be dissidents who will initiate the, uh, the transformation of society, political transformation. There is some possibility that they will be uh, influential and uh, powerful in the sense of moral authority. Yes, in this sense, there is some uh, possibility, but not maybe in political. In short, yeah. mm -hmm. I would like to add one small comment about my son. In 1968, I brought him to my fa family in the next region, and he spoke in Ukrainian. And my aunt, listening to his Ukrainian, said, Oh, he is so small and already Bandera. He's only Bandera. <laughs> And then I think since time is, is drawing to a close first, uh, uh, I'd like to say that although this, this uh, Ukrainian studies program was mentioned first and our first lecture was on Ukrainian dissidents, this is the, our goal is to try and be as comparative uh, uh, in discussing these. I think we have had a wonderful start of this. Uh, that is the tour de force of, of telling us the entire development of the Ukrainian dissident movement and then bringing us up to current affairs. And I think we will be returning to that in these comparative discussions. If I did just add, since I didn't take the chair's prerogative and ask a question, I think one thing that was very much on my mind, and I, and I would like, perhaps in another discussion, uh, Professor Maranovich could tell us that is the combination of his religious values and dissident movement when it comes into his creation and how that relates to dissidents, uh, nonconformism, and also this Eastern and Western Ukrainian, or, or Western Ukraine, Lithuania, and a few other places being quite different from the rest of the Soviet Union and more like Poland in many ways, just on that religious issue, I think plays a role, so I will add that. Uh, I. Uh, uh, for those, we're so happy that so many of you could attend. Uh, I made a few remarks at the beginning about the organizing institutions who organize this, but of course institutions don't organize, people organize. Standing and hovering in the back is Dr. Marco Andrejcik, who is the heart and soul of the organization of this. <laughs> I will now uh, ask 
ask if he has any announcements he would like to make as to other than uh, tomorrow we start in this room at 9.30 with our first panel. Uh, but now, please, we have a reception that you're all invited to in the room from Manhattan. And we'd like to thank Dr. Marinovich for a wonderful presentation.